So it still is really great to be in, in front of a real, uh, real people because the last two, uh, two keynote talk I gave were during the COVID and it was a distance for Pacific Graphics and SMI and it was just, you know, I was alone in my flat so it, now it feels really great. And as well, I just finished being president of the CS department of Ecole Polytechnique for the, for, for the one week ago. They elected a new president, so now I can get, come back to research. So this, you are my first, uh, uh, my, my first co research community uh, with which I will communicate a little bit. So um, let me introduce what I, so this is really, this talk is about what I want to do in the next three years, and, but I, I will give, of course, examples uh, in a, of what I already did in this direction. My motivation is really to make visual representation uh, useful and think of how they can, uh, they can be used by humankind. In fact, I think that visual representations are mandatory for us humans to understand the world around us and to create new stuff. An example is a, is, a, is a work from Leonardo da Vinci. For instance, he represents on the left here, you see that he represents what he understands on the branching of trees already with a picture, which is better than a long text. And if we want, he wants to create something, he will draw it, and here it's a flying wind. But if he did have some means of uh, animation, he would certainly have used it. If you animate his drawing, you understand even better uh, what, he, what he meant and, and, and what he was envisioning. On the right, you see some, uh, some visual representations of cells and, and kind of story of cells that go out, out uh, through a membrane and then they, they, they come into a medium with a lots of fibers. Uh, so this is also, you see how much uh, drawings in science can be, uh, can be expressive. They help structuring ideas. They increase also the intuition on a phenomenon. But drawings are limited. Of course, they, only, they are only two-dimensional two depiction. Uh, while we want to represent uh, very often a shape which is three-dimensional and that moves and deforms over time. Also, editing is difficult. When you draw, you have an eraser, but you cannot deform. And uh, so you, you, the elements are, are all on the, in the same drawing. It's very difficult to, to, to edit. And also, it's impossible to interact. So I was thinking how to make this visual representation really useful for science. Could we use a digital media for scientific thinking? I'm not talking of scientific visualization. There are lots of colleagues here working on that domain where you already have the data, you want to visualize it. What I want to visualize is a bit different, is to help during the thinking process of a scientist. Could they have, instead of a, a, just a paper and a pen, some, a, some digital medium, a little bit like uh, the tubes the chemists are, 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 are using and they do some experiment with, with it. Could they have some digital media in front of them and be able to do directly their experiment in virtual? Uh, of course, if they, uh, so this is why I say, if you reconstruct capture data, you will only show one instance of the phenomena. Let's, let me give that example uh, where, where I worked on with a, a physical chem chemist called Didier Roux in France. So he was uh, studying the changes of phases in a, in a liquid mixture. Uh, if he takes his data, this is a kind of visualization of the data he can have, but this, this, there is only one instance, no possible interaction. So it doesn't really help, I think, for abstraction. The little drawings on top are the abstraction that he has, that he explained to us. So this liquid is first made of isolated bubbles, then it goes into a sponge phase, and then it goes to a strip phase when you have strips of the two liquids which are in the, in the leaves. And what we would like ideally is to go directly from his drawing to some animation th that he has in mind and help him really think about the phenomena and then have some more insight on the phenomena. But currently, if he wants to model it uh, for instance, here using implicit surfaces, what he needs to do is to explain it uh, to an artist, to a computer artist, able to use, I don't know, uh, Maya or whatever, uh, uh, Blender or whatever creative system, to be able to, uh, to translate his vision into some animated 3D, 3D content. He explained to an artist, then it will be a trial and error because the artist will not directly get what he has in mind. And then it's a kind of tedious work. But in addition to that, it will be just general uh, 3D illustration because when once the video, even if it's animated, once the video has been created, the scientist cannot interact with it. The scientist cannot try to manipulate this media. He cannot do some experiment with it because it's a video that was created once and that's it. So, uh, in fact, with this, this, the media we currently have, the scientists cannot interact and refine their thoughts. 
So in this talk, I will explain what I call creative AI. In fact, I was calling this creative AI already uh, five years ago. But now this word has been, has been taken for totally different things. So what I think is creative AI is smart 3D environments that will make us humans more creative. And I want to apply creative AI has to, to, to set up 3D environments that will be used as visual test beds in science. Let me explain my methodology. So the idea first, to be able to test in direct and to add some, uh, to do your experiments and to add things, first you, you, you need that the, uh, that, that the simulation of the physical phenomena are interactive. And for that, I, we worked, and not only me, but many people worked in the last 20 years into interactive simulation models that may, may not be very, very accurate, but the, it's very good to express ideas. And very, uh, uh, so the solution to make them interactive is to think of layered models, which model each, uh, um, each sub-phenomena has a different layers, and over time, these layers interact together. I will give an example. And so this enables us to embed knowledge. I will give an example. The second part of the methodology is expressive design, uh, which is, uh, as I was said in the intro introduction, to have some in intuitive media for the scientist, for the user, to be able to give some input. It can be sculpting gestures, sketching gestures, transfer, transfer, I mean, copy, smart copy-paste. I want to, to take this content from this video, copy it in my virtual world, for instance. So this can also enable to learn a little bit from some data, for instance, when you do this copy-paste, but you will learn only an aspect of it, if you like. Uh, so it comes to learning from example, because everything cannot, the knowledge can be not always expressed through laws. Sometimes you prefer just giving some small examples. And I will see, I will show you some first applications to geology, ecosystems, and paleontology, because I'm working with prehistorians right now. So the first challenge is to provide interactive ways to do visual simulation. And uh, let me uh, uh, also remind you the complexity of natural phenomena. Natural phenomena, they have different categories of complexity. The first complexity is a number of elements. If I take this natural scene here, a photo from when I, where I live near Grenoble uh, before. So, uh, uh, so this natural scene, you have all the, all maybe all the leaves of the trees that will be interacting with the wind, and you have the water, and you have the rocks, and you have uh, the, the water maybe carrying as well some, uh, uh, some, some little pieces of, uh, of tree and so on. So they are all interacting together. The number of, ele of elements, both shape and motion are subject to specific laws. Of course, the shape of the mountain is shaped by erosion. And, 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 and the, the motion of the fluid, for instance, conserves the mass. And you have these complex interactions between dif these different things. So uh, if you want to model everything at a very fine grain, it will be impossible to have all this simulation in real time. Our solution that we developed in my group in the last maybe 20 years is to develop hybrid model that will embed knowledge and work as layers model. I will give here a recent example, which is an sim interactive simulation of clouds and wind. To do that, in fact, we, we thought of what could be a minimal simulation and how can we add knowledge to to, um, to enhance the simulation by adding consistent procedural details based on knowledge. So let me detail this first example. So uh, in all the examples I will show today, we are working uh, with scientists of other disciplines. So here with a geophysicist, for instance. So uh, in fact, the clouds are a condensation of uh, water va vapor. And so they, they appear when the moist air reaches saturation. Uh, the, the key factor is that they depend on temperature and moisture. And there is an evaporation from, la from water bodies if you are near the sea or if there is a lake. They also interact with the shape of mountain. And so for many, many years in computer graphics, you had lots of works on cloud rendering. This is an example from Grenoble a long time ago, Antoine Boutor. But there was nothing on cloud animation. It's quite difficult to simulate because you have a tightly coupled, tightly coupled thermal and fluid dynamics. It's a huge simulation domain. In the simulation I will show, we simulate 50 square kilometers on the Earth and 10 kilometers on the up direction. Uh, and also, uh, you need a very fine sampling, 
to be able to, if you want to capture the structure of the cloud, you will need a very fine sampling. So this is why it took so long to be solved. So the solution we propose in this paper is really a minimal simulation. In fact, talking with the geophysicists, their understanding is that they, they, you can do a volumetric simulation, it would be too huge. But there are some key layers. You, it's sufficient to do, to do a two-dimensional simulation, a few two-dimensional simulation in a few layers at different altitudes that are key altitudes for clouds. And in, of course, there will be also some vertical uplift that can be either convective, maybe, I don't know if I have, no. Okay. Either convective or based on dynamic pressure. And in fact, you have also the holographic effect of the, on, of the terrain. The, in, in fact, a mountain will just compress a little bit. It will dump velocity because it compresses a little bit the coming air. And so it will, it will create an uplift. And then the difference of pressure after the mountain will make the cloud go down again. So uh, we can simulate this just in a few layers with adding some laws for going up and down between the layers. Then when once it's done, the key feature is that is to add procedural detail, but in an informed way. In fact, what we can do is to compute in each cell of the layers that we have, uh, we have computed. We, we, com we compute where we are in, in terms of convectivity and altitude. And we have pre-computed from, from knowledge from this field of uh, uh, physicists that study clouds. They have the different categories of clouds that are really char characterized by, by the amount of convectivity and at which altitude they appear, and they have quite different shapes. This enables us to, have, uh, to really uh, tune procedural details based on this classification. So, in fact, for each of, each of the grid cells, we have all layers that are simulated. We interpolate to have the intermediate grid cells. Then we can group uh, the different cells into clouds and classify them. And finally, we have a rendering that looks like a real cloud. So uh, these are a few examples of the input. So the input has a map with, tem with temperature, the map of water. And from the water, we have this wind that will be created because uh, that will create the convective uplift. And then you see on the top the different layers that we have, and we, you see also the rendering of the details in the different clouds that we have. Here you see, uh, you see the, uh, on, on top the final rendering, and at the bottom you can see the simulation itself. And you see how these clouds are deformed when they come over, over, uh, over the mountain. Over the, the, so there are, these are these different categories of clouds. How they form as well uh, over an island. And at the, at the end, all the clouds are, are finally combined. So we can have the island with the cumulus and the windy mountain with the stratus. So just an example of for this interactive simulation. So the second challenge I wanted to talk about is expressive design. Really, how can you, um, can you be based on the user gesture to be able to create contents? Long time ago, I was working on a virtual sculpture, and we designed with Paul Cry, who was a postdoc in my group at the time, uh, this hand, simu hand simulate, um, yes, uh, hand navigator that enabled to navigate a, a hand in the real world, in real, in, in virtual world in real time. And we had this, this uh, layered model for virtual clay, so it was exactly the same as for the clouds already. Uh, this virtual clay was, uh, uh, was as well a, a layered model which enable to have it react in, uh, in real time to the user gesture. So it just an ex exemplify that, in fact, what we would like to be able to interact with shapes can be very close to what we use in the real world. We, we, we can um, uh, sculpt uh, little things with, with clay. We, can also, we also sketch. And this is an example of the, of the work I, we did long time ago on sketch-based modeling using implicit surfaces, which is translating automatically a two-dimensional sketch into a 3D scene done as well with implicit surfaces. Both are using implicit surfaces. And in, in fact, here we, uh, at, at the right, you compute the skeleton in, inside the shape. And around this skeleton, you generate implicit surfaces. And you guess the three dimension from the perception and the, and the two dimension. So this is just inspiration. But I want now to add something. Can we combine this sculpting and sketching things with some knowledge that will enable scientists to use it to express their thoughts? 
So sculpting plus knowledge, we did a kind of old contribution that I want to, to remind, which is uh, sculpting these uh, structured shapes. In fact, what, uh, what we did in, uh, in a neurographist paper a kind of long, long time ago, but it's inspiring to me, it is really to think, okay, when the shape is structured, when you know the structure, you can express the shape as a puzzle shape grammar. So this is, for instance, a little castle here is made of uh, uh, four categories of, uh, of uh, pieces, A, B, C, and D. So A as, as a tower without flags, D are towers with flag. And then you have uh, several rules that can be it's a grammar, so you can apply uh, replacement rules. You can remove B, it's still a castle. If you replace A by D, it's still a castle. If you insert B, it's still a castle. This, these rules could be used to generate like uh, random castles, but this is not at all what the user wants. What the user would, would want is to be able to sculpt the castle as if it was clay, and each time you sculpt it, for instance, if you, if you want to just extend it, uh, you want new pieces to be inserted, for instance, new B to be inserted if I pull my castle. If I compress it, I want B to be suppressed, for instance. So you want that the castle automatically evolve based on user gesture, exactly like a, a sculpting system. So this is what we, we did in the paper called Mutable Elastic Models. So the idea is that you have a physically based simulation that drives this, uh, this, this, uh, this procedural model based on a puzzle grammar. So each time I cut, for instance, some towers will appear. Each time, each, each time I pull my castle, uh, the windows will not become larger, but there will be more windows, for instance. And so in a few gestures, you can sculpt a little medieval city from your castle. So this is an inspiration. This is not for science, but this is an inspiration of what we could do when we extend sculpting. And this is now a use, a use we did with a geomorphologist called Jean Braun of the same ID. So, um, so Jean Braun studies, in fact, um, um, the formation of mountain ranges, something that was missing in computer graphics, because in computer graphics, when we model terrain, we, we model erosion, but, but it's all very um, often erosion due to water. It's not, it's, it's not the formation of mountain, it's just it's a local phenomena, and you fail to have these mountain ranges. In fact, these mountain regions, they, ranges, they come from the collision between two tectonic plates that you see here on the, on, on the figure. So you have, a, in fact, you have one of the plates that goes under the other one and a little bit on the top of the other one. You have a main fold here. And what happens is that this plate here will fold and there will be this so-called tectonic uplift. So the mountain will go on here and will fold at the same time. There are lots of layers, so each layer will fold at a, at a different uh, like a wave, wavelength. And all this happens with the constant volume. So these are the kind of insight a, scientific, a scientist can gi give us. This is what we are looking for, the, the mental model he has on, on a phenomenon. And our, our idea is really to inspire on what we did on sculpting that you see here, but now we will just, with our hands, push the technocynic plates one under the other. And the interaction is even much simpler. We don't need any hand navigator. We can just have a big, uh, a large uh, uh, touch table where we push the tectonic plate and we will have the mountain emerge at the, at the middle. So this is what we implemented. And reusing our idea of a layered model to have interactive simulation. So as I said, in layers model, uh, you think of a physical phenomena has uh, several sub-phenomena that interact together. And here, our three phenomena are to see crust has a plastic material that can deform at constant volume. Then you see crust has layered sheets so that each, each little layer will fold with a given uh, wavelength. And then you have your terrain, which has this uplift due to, to this collision of tectonic plates, but also has the erosion due to rivers. And we really, we, we have, we use an erosion equation from geomorphology at the scale of the rivers, not at the scale of uh, just a drop of water that is falling. Okay, so the, this leads to a real time um, a model for, for Earth's crust. And here you can see the fingers of the user which are pushing the tectonic plates where appeared as little dots. They are pushing the tectonic plates and you have in real time the formation of these mountain ranges. So you can see really the mountain emerge and also being eroded by the rivers. And if you see from the side a cut of it, this is what is happening here. So you see, the, and you see the erosion. What is really interesting is the, the combination of this formation and the erosion. So, uh, of course, we do it as a 3D model. So this is the first time the geomorphologist friend could see 
the result in, in 3D, the result of their model, because they were not able to have a, a, a so efficient simulation. And in terms of computer graphics, you see for the first time the eroded cliff with the different layers of ground, which are not here in other uh, uh, terrain model in computer graphics. So this is really interesting. Uh, in fact, this demo uh, is now in a museum. In a, we have a little science museum at Ecole Polytechnique, and so we have this uh, box where the user can really uh, sculpt the mountain and see from the side of the box the, the folds in the cut of the terrain. So you see these uh, models where we express the vision of a scientist can also serve for vulgarization of science and for museums. This is also something that really motivates me for the future applications. Can we also combine sketching with knowledge? Yes, we can. And in fact, I come back to a kind of old paper in my career, but that, that really uh, strikes me as one of the most interesting work that I did. So here I was uh, working with biologists, biologists specialized of tree growth. And uh, we were thinking, OK, how could we create a tree in real time? But not uh, a tree like I press a button and I have an oak tree. Think of the old olive tree that is in the garden of your grandfather and which is a bit twisted and has really a particular shape. How to get this tree with something which is correct, but you want to control, to draw, to be able to draw the shape you would like. And here we took an inspiration from art and from biology. And we, we noticed that both artists on the left and both biologists, when they, they sketch trees, they, they do it from coarse to fine. They start by sketching the coarse silhouette of the tree. And then, little by little, they will be adding details. So we were thinking, could our sketch-based modeling system do the same? Start from coarse and then add little by little detail. So we had this idea of structure of the tree, the branching, from the silhouette. And, and so we had this idea of building from multi-resolution sketches. Each time the user will sketch uh, the, rough, uh, the rough silhouette, then we will get some more ab about, the, about the structure. And also we added some knowledge from perception and, uh, and, and from biology. So let me explain the, the idea. So the, the user will first sketch a rough silhouette. From this silhouette, we will use kind of skeletons, like medial axis, to compute the branching. But if you take the medial axis, it will not at all give exactly uh, uh, the right shape. No, I don't have it here. But uh, in fact, you have also to take into account the way in biology the branches, uh, plant phyllotaxis tells you with different categories of plant how, how these branches should go. So we take the medial axis, but we only keep the extremities of the medial axis. And then we use the phyllotaxy of this specific category of plant that the person wants to draw. After that, uh, the system automatically builds some uh, construction lines, which are here in black. And in, within this construction line, uh, the, the user can zoom on only one of them and redraw the shape at a, at a, at a, at a smaller scale, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And since a, 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 a tree is self-similar, in fact, if we learn the probability, the density of branches, we can copy-paste this the same density everywhere. And we took also into account a law for perception. This is a view from above. We, we found in, in perception studies, this is a camera, that if, if you sketch a tree, you will never sketch the branches that go towards you, and you don't sketch the branches that go to the back. OK, so we only sketch the branches we sketch should be splitted into given uh, parts. And this means that if you want to reconstruct the tree in 3D, you need to add procedurally to duplicate this distribution in the front and in the back. So knowing, combining this knowledge from biology and this knowledge from perception, plus the sketches from the user, we were able to set up an interactive sketching system. So this was taken uh, in real time. The user is a, so you see the, the construction line are built automatically. The user can resketch, can go uh, then to another, to another dimension, sketch again. And each time it sketch, it will create a distribution of branches which can later be duplicated to the, other, to, to the other branches of the same level. Then the leaves are sketched, and the time the user will uh, just zoom out, uh, you will have the full 3D tree that will be reconstructed. So this is exactly what I meant by putting knowledge into the sketching system that we will provide to scientists. Here, there is something which is interesting, that the statistics of the sub-branches need to be learned. Can we generalize this? So these statistics are like sparse user input. 
It's not at all deep learning. The user, by giving this shape, is giving an example of statistics. So, in fact, this is something that can be generalized, and it, co it, it uh, comes to my third challenge, is into this system where we will sculpt and sketch, can we also learn from example? As I already mentioned, so nature is really full of details. There are really too many elements to be sketched. Fortunately, they have heavy self-similarities. So can we learn consistent distribution? The idea is to learn either from user-defined example or from simulation results. So learning from example, one of our first really uh, good work in this was called wall brush. Wallbrush was the idea that if you want to cover a virtual world with distributions, say, of trees, stones, and blades of grass, you, will, you don't want to position them one by one. In fact, in video games, again, five years ago, when we visited Ubisoft in Paris, they were still positioning each bush and each tree uh, every, for this huge space the, for their video, video games. Artists were doing it. So what will you, if the distribution, at least to initialize a distribution that is uh, always with the same properties, it could be very nice to do it from a, a tiny example. So in this paper, the user interactively designs a small example where he can put some stones on the slope, some trees where it's uh, flat enough, and then some blades of grass uh, around the trees. Then there is some learning, and this is light learning from a single example. In fact, we use um, uh, point processes. And these uh, this point processes, the idea is that, uh, the, the intuitive idea is that from each point in your, in your small database, you will learn in each ring around the point at different distance a number of elements. For instance, the interaction between grass and grass, grass and tree, grass and stone, uh, stone and slope. Uh, you, will, you will learn it, and each interaction will be uh, each time stored as an histogram. Then you, then you have a collection of histograms, and a given collection of histograms is now stored in what we call a palette, like in, in a painting system, because we inspire from this gesture-based creation, the user will be given some painting tools. So in fact, each time he sets up a little example, all the histograms are a given color in a palette, so that he can paint his virtual world with this color. If he paints with this color, it will always put the stones on the slopes, so the blade of grass near the trees, blah, 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 exactly. And so what we, uh, what we had finally is that this expressive design, we, we added pipette tools to take from an example, painting tools like brushes, gradient tools to interpolate between such so-called colors, and sculpting and transfer tools. So let me exemplify, and I will explain a little bit more while we look at the video. So here we're just painting the same color everywhere with a good property. If you use a brush, you see that the brush doesn't do the same thing everywhere. It just puts uh, elements based on the distribution. And you can even move a little forest, and you see that the trees will not stay where there is too much soap. You can also interpolate between two colors. And this is what is done on the bottom. Is we use optimal mass transport to have an interpolation that will really uh, give you the right, in, uh, the right intermediate between the two colors. Here it's a brush that, pen, that paints some uh, dense trees at the middle and some less dense trees at the others. And here, if you do deformation, it's like seam carving for images. You want to have something visually stable, but to insert new content in between. And then you can also learn a, a correlation with, uh, with um, roads and correlation with the uh, rivers. So finally, uh, you, you end up with a large uh, virtual world that could be in, in, uh, instantiated in minutes. And you will see better here the example where we align uh, houses automatically to, this, uh, to these rivers and so on. So this, it looks really like a toy. But imagine now that we, we will learn from a simulation. This paper is also a your graphics paper. Which is, a, which is uh, the previous one was a CGRAPH paper. This one is a Eurographics paper called EcoBrush. In EcoBrush, what we wanted to, to do is really to be able to paint and to control intuitively full ecosystems. And so uh, what we did for that, the, the, the rough idea, is that if we take a terrain, we can very well cluster the terrain so that each part of a different color has the same, the same condition. 
For instance, all the paths that face south and that are at a given altitude or with a given, uh, given uh, ground uh, will, will have the same condition and so on. So you have the different clusters that we computed on the terrain here. For each of these clusters with the same condition, then we can have some sandbox simulation of an ecosystem. So just a pre-computed simulation of competition between plants. So we, initial, we initiate a few species, we use a, and, and we make them grow. And you know that uh, plants interact both for their, for their roots that, uh, that, that take nutrients in the soil, but also the, the canopy of the plant is also competing for the sun. So the plants are like, if you like, two discs, the roots and the sun, which are competi competing. And so we, use, uh, we reuse a kind of uh, simulation of ecosystem that many other colleagues used. And so then, with our war brush uh, mechanism, we can learn this simulation result, which will enable the user to paint this, this reality distribution on terrains. And what is good is that we can also use some semantic brushes. For, because we have those simulations, so we know what the ecosystem looks after 50 years or after 100 years, or if you destroy this species or add this species, you can, you can have this. So this enables to have semantic brushes. For instance, on the left, you have the African savanna, on which we added destruction made by large animals, and we can also add destruction due, due, to, due to fires. Uh, produced, for instance, by, by human. Here you have a Mediterranean uh, landscape. Here's a Grand Canyon, but with some Mediterranean uh, plants. And here, uh, like uh, alpine uh, landscapes. Uh, now, let me come to, uh, to contribution from one of my former PhD students who is in the room here, Pierre, Pierre Ecormier-Noca, who is now a postdoc in, in Vienna. And so, uh, when he arrived in my group, we wanted really to improve this uh, learning and, uh, uh, and um, uh, 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 learning and generation of ecosystem, plant ecosystem. So uh, what we did uh, is in fact to generalize uh, this uh, point distribution that were from statistics into disk distribution because we wanted to take into account the fact that the canopy interact and that you can uh, uh, very well have a small, I don't know, some mushrooms, for instance, that only grow under trees. So we didn't need a distribution of point, but what we wanted was really a distribution of disk where you can say that the red disk has always inside this large disk and these are, the, these are the mushrooms, for instance, this is the grass and these are the other, the other disks. But in order to be able to learn distribution of disk, so this means that you have also the radius and you have this inclusion. And so it was not obvious to do it in a, in a, in a single formula. In in fact, our solution was to introduce a new normalized matrix for disk that, uh, that you have here. So it's based on the extent and the overlap. And we learn now this, uh, we extend these uh, point processes to disk processes. Uh, with, uh, so this means that, that, we, that, that we have something that will give a new norm called F norm here, that this disk distinguishes disjoint disks, tangent disks, overlapping disks, and nested disks. And this really solves the problem, and that we can have much more accurate uh, ecosystems. Another thing is that we thought, OK, these virtual worlds, they are static. Uh, could we animate them? Could we animate add animals? And the fact is, uh, for the animals, it's maybe more difficult to learn the specific shape of herd. This is also a good example where we have no real knowledge, because if we use boids or so, or, or so to, to animate, we have to input laws, but we don't know exactly how this animal behaves. So here, another part of uh, Pierre's PhD was really to think, OK, could we inspire from the photos of the, herb, of the herds and learn the distribution that we have within a herd? So in fact, here, uh, uh, the idea is to animate and to say, okay, at this point of my animation, at this keyframe, I want my herd to, to look uh, like this photo. And on the, on the other part, I want it to look like this photo. And you position the different keyframes uh, here. And for this, we needed to extend this uh, learning and analysis of distribution uh, in order to be able to account the general shape as well of the, of the herd with the density of animals. So we added these two characteristics on top of the distribution of disk, now it's uh, ellipses, not disk for the animals. So it's a, or distribution of oriented stuff. And what is really good is that these photos have very, very, very different numbers of animals, but it's not a problem at all, because what we learn is learn the statistics of the distribution, and from any photo, we can always regenerate with a different number of animals. 
So this enables us really to use this pipette tool from a photo and regenerate the adequate distribution. So let me give an example. So here we will uh, choose different photos that we place at different keyframes. So you see the shapes of the herds are very different. So photos will be then analyzed and they will be, uh, they, they will be uh, then the user will choose the final number of animals they want. Uh, here is just a simple keyframe trajectory for the herd which is in between. And we will interpolate the statistics. Uh, so for instance, if we choose 200 animals, uh, here you will have your 200 animals that will come and that will, when they come near to the keyframe, in fact, the distributions of their shapes will be uh, reproducing the distribution that was learned from that photo. When they go elsewhere, the distribution of their, of their shapes will adjust to another photo. Okay, I accelerated some parts, which are, is quite different, it's more elongated, and so on. So this is already good. But at that stage, I met with paleontologists. In fact, I met with a, with a great guy called Henry de Lumley, a French paleontologist, which discovers a cave before my birth, uh, the, Arago, the Arago Cave uh, in the uh, Totavel Valley in the, in, the, in the south of France. And he found the first, at the time, Homo erectus in Europe, called Homme de Totavel. He invited me and my group to visit, to visit them in Totavel. And then we started a pluridisciplinary uh, collaboration. What is really interesting working with prehistorians is that they are already working in, in uh, pluridisciplinary teams of scientists. And in fact, they are studying this past ecosystem. So we thought, could our tools be used for them to see their model, even to be immersed with virtual reality within the, the environment they are studying? And so, um, wh what did they discover? In fact, in Totavel, they have a cave, which you, you see uh, here in the mountain. And here there is a river. So here the, there is a river passing here. And in the cave, the cave was occupied. And they have uh, different layers. They are, they are really going through the layers of, the, of this. It's between 100,000 years and 700,000 years. And in the layers of uh, 450,000 years, they found this uh, skull of the men of Totavel. And they found also uh, different remains of animals and so on. And for the moment, to express their knowledge, they have to communicate with artists. So Henri de Lemley communicates a lot with artists that will they describe what they imagine and the artist will paint for them. Or even they have in their small museum in Totavel some uh, uh, real I don't know, models uh, and, and they try to put them in the environment they imagine. But really with computer graphics, we could do, do much more. And we, we could also enable them to express really and uh, also do experiments, as I said at the beginning, do experiments with their data, change their hypothesis, see how it will change this. And so this is what we did, still in Pierre's PhD thesis. So uh, uh, the idea uh, was that we take as input the, the, what they know of the paleo climate. They know we, they have also, we have also the terrain. For the terrain, for the moment, we use the terrain we have now that we have the topography. We didn't do the anti-erosion to bring back the terrain in time to the shape it had. This is a, still a project for me to be done. So for the moment, we use the topography we have now. And, and then there are maps of temperatures, the maps of illumination. We can compute map of, of moisture. So we have all the elements to have the resources for, for, for plants. What we want is to enable, uh, enable the, the paleontologists to explore their, 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 their landscape. And also, when you explore landscape, you don't see the animals all the time. What we wanted also is to model the eroded trail, because the animals go or, or, always go by herd between their resources to drink, to eat, and so on. So they will finish by eroding the trails. And the eroded trails are much more visible on the terrain when you are, don't see the animals. So we wanted this as well. And in fact, there were specific challenges. We don't want at all a pre-predator simulation because from the remains in the cave, the paleontologists have a hypothesis on the species that were there and their proportion. Since they, they want to input their hypothesis, so they want to have specific proportions between species. If we use a pre-predator simulation, a species may kill all the other ones and it will not be there, that. Uh, so uh, we wanted this. 
to their knowledge, and also to have a, uh, we need a precise embedding of plants and animated animals, because in the cave they found remains of this and these categories of plants through the pollens, for instance, but they didn't know which one were near the river, which one were on the cliff. Remember, it's a nice valley with some cliffs and the river. So we need really to instantiate the plants and the animals at, right, at the right place. So uh, the key idea was to progressively instantiate the species up the, the food chain. So we use the resources of our plant, uh, uh, then first to instantiate the plant. And the, the fact is we solve each time a greedy algorithm. We compute, uh, we have an hypothesis that we want an ecosystem which is at quasi-equilibrium. This means that each, at each level of the food chain, uh, the animals or the plant will be able to, learn, to eat only what, what, what is produced during the year by, the, by, by their resources. For the animal, only with the newborns, the number, same number of the, new, that's the number of the newborns of the other species, for instance. So they, they eat the surplus, and we will build uh, iteratively a resource access graph and the species will have an, uh, an accessibility uh, map. So let me explain a little bit more. So on the terrain, we have the map of resource, resources. This is for animals, for instance. And so we can compute also as well, their, uh, depending on the species, can they cross the river? Can they climb the cliff? So they can be in confinement area. Some, some uh, for instance, herds can only stay in parts of the terrain with the same color because they, could not, uh, they would not be able to, to cross the river or to climb the cliff. Then to be able to instantiate at a given level of the food chain, given the graph of their resources, we'll use a greedy competition algorithm. We have this hypothesis of ecosystem at a stability. So we, based on fitness, we take, we, 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 we compute one after one the, the best instantiation. And, and this, we can account for the proportion of each species uh, given by the prehistorians. So it's really expression of their knowledge. And you see that for our, our resource access graph, we have these resources for herbivore that are the little green dots, but then this means that this part of their confinement area becomes now where are the herds of herbivores. So when we go to carnivore, this large area is now one of the resources for carnivore. Here, for instance, the carnivore can cross the river, while the, the herbivore could not in this little picture. And so you see that little by little, the herds are, are, are instantiated. And also, each time we have finished a level, we compute also their daily pass. For instance, for herds of herbivore, we know what they need because uh, prehistorians uh, have um, models from current ecosystem. Okay, this kind of old deer was reindeer was uh, similar to the one we have now, I don't know where, near the North Pole. And so they have a hypothesis of what they need every day. And this means that we can compute uh, a daily pass for them. And this will tell the carnivore where they are. And we will take care of this for computing the eroded trail, based on how many animals walk every day this trail and so on. To validate, because we wanted to publish at SIGGRAPH, they had asked us to validate on a real nowadays ecosystem, and I'm very glad that at the end we managed to do it. It took a long time. But what we did is that we, we, we took Bright Angel Valley, which is a part of the Grand Canyon. This is a reference photo on the top. Here is our virtual environment where we have instantiated the ecosystem. And in fact, uh, we, we, we can show, we, we compared with the satellite photo, and you can see in black the actual trails. Uh, nowadays, the actual trails we see on satellite photo are not from animals, they may be from uh, uh, Range Rovers or whatever, but they go as if they were bisons, they go from through the same places, so it's not too far. And we see that our trails are not too bad compared to the real trail we have. And when you see this compared to the photo, uh, we are very happy, it quite fits. So this was able to convince the reviewers that it, there is some ground in what, what we do. And now these are the results that we provide to the prehistorians. They, can, they have two views. Either on the, as on the left, they can see the their, their, their herds on the, on the map, on their daily path, or else they can also explore the 3D environment by just going into this, this 3D environment, and they will see some of the animals. So for instance, um, we will come probably to a troop of grazing animals here. Then later we will may see, uh, yeah, we see a bear here, which is isolated, he's uh, uh, on, on his own, and then we will go to another part of the valley. So really it, it gives this tool where the prehistorian can get immersed somehow in their hypothesis. 
and change their hypothesis. Here are a few walls that are coming as well. And what is good as well is that we do it automatically, and we can do it for several climates. So in fact, here you had a kind of uh, temperate, uh, you had the temperate climate that was cool and humid, but you can go to the glacial age, which was uh, 50,000 uh, 50, years before, and we have less trees, as we see on the map. And so this is more like it was lo look like in this glacial uh, age, with uh, different categories of animals. And of course, uh, it was uh, with, with snow. And in order not to have enough tree, we added something, is that we added the lack of fer fertilization from animals to the soil. To be, so we, we did a little loop to enable to have something which is more coherent. Of course, the prehistorians want to go on working with us, and the next challenge they are giving me now is to be able to simulate pre-human activities. In fact, they have only a few bones of this uh, Homo heidelbergensis that they found, and so we need, uh, there are a lot of challenges for computer graphics here. First, the specific morphology of these humans is to be extracted from only a few bones. Then, what they want is that we train autonomous characters, for instance, using reinforcement learning. They have hypotheses on their goals, such as gathering resources for food, but also for having tools, some specific flints that they, they want to have, to, have to, to make their tools. And so, also, what ideally, what the predatorian would dream of is that we find out how they were chasing this large animal, like mammoth, or very large uh, uh, other mammifers that, that, that were there, uh, because they found a lot of remains in the cave, and they don't know exactly what would be their techniques. If we could learn it with reinforcement learning, it would be their dream. I don't know at all if we can manage to do that. But we, we are, little by little, starting to, to do that. We have also to solve for locomotion in natural environment. If you see, I don't know, you are maybe not working in character animation, but many character animation is done from motion capture. Motion capture is done on flat ground, which is not very flexible. If I walk in natural environment with the snow, with the mud, with maybe some meadows, with the, with, with the grass and, and, and the bushes, it will be very different. There can be also sliding rocks. Uh, the, the slopes and, and, and also the, they, they needed to go to the river and then to climb back to the cave. So it's really, uh, it's not walking in a, on a trail. So these, these are uh, all what we want to solve. And in fact, uh, the way we, want, we are thinking to do it is to do it with two levels, a little bit like my layered model that I already insist on. So a course level will be the group motion planning from the maps, the maps with, the, with the, 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 the slopes, the vegetation, the goals for a typical journey. We, we are comparing now in my lab two formulations, an energy-based formulation from, local, from locomotion that enables us to have extended shorted paths, and then the reinforcement learning based also on energy. And we, we model, of course, the fact that uh, on some of these trails, the pe people have to carry load, like uh, dead animals and so on. And then at the final level, we want also to have this motion which is adapted to this uh, very strange morphology of this Homo erectus, very, quite different from us. And so, uh, they, and then also they should change of locomotion style on, st on slopes, mud, and so on. And even what said the prehistorians, that they tried to move very silently on dense vegetation because they could themselves become prey of this predator, or maybe they want to catch an animal. So walking silently is something we can also model in computer graphics, but was never, uh, never tackled so far. And so I give, just show you a li two little contributions in this direction, which it doesn't, don't focus yet on this uh, Homo erectus. But recently, what we did in, the, in, in, in my group is a PhD from uh, Eduardo Alvarado, is uh, really in, uh, studying how an input motion, which is a kinematic motion, can be transformed to account from working in the in a soft ground, so working in a snow, mud, or, or sand. And, uh, and first of all, there is this uh, center of mass that needs to be always uh, into the, on, on the support polygon when you when you walk. So it makes this balancing of the character. That, so the input motion is the red one, and the blue one is the one with the balancing. When you go down a slope, you will be a little bit back way. And, uh, and up a, a slope, you have to, to go a little bit uh, more forward. Okay, and here you see, uh, you see the, 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 the ground, how the ground deforms. What did also Eduardo is the interaction of the human with the, with the environment, such as uh, you, want, you have now a dense vegetation in, in front of you, and you want to be able to push uh, obstacles in order to, to really uh, uh, find your way into that.
And what we encountered is that, in fact, when you interact with this uh, vegetation, you are pushing the bushes in front of you, you don't always want to do it uh, uh, with the same stiffness in your muscles. Because uh, when you push grass, you don't have this, uh, you will do it very lightly. And if I want to push a branch or to push here the fence, I need much more, much more tension. And so we reuse a contribution from Michael Neff, an old contribution, which is called antagonist control. Uh, where well, we have this uh, tension relaxation by two ant antagonist muscles. And what we did is that we adapted this tension relaxation so that it matches a uh, given kinematic motion. So we compute it to match the kinematic motion, except when we have interaction. And then we have this anticipation where we, we, we simulate the vision from the, from the virtual human. When they see something, an obstacle in front, they evaluate uh, how, uh, how um, um, heavy he must be or flexible it must be. From that, it will anticipate by preparing the muscles. And you see, with the ad this adaptation, you have something which is much more realistic. Look here on the top, uh, the way it pushes the grass is not realistic. And then it will not manage to, uh, to push really the, the things that are more heavy, such as, for instance, you see it from the fence. Here, you, you can really keep the fence like that, while in the other case, the, the, the arms were, were, were too flexible to push the fence. Of course, this is not yet what we want to have with the prehistorians, but it gives you some ideas of the work we are conducting. Let me conclude now. So, in fact, I think that smart 3D models are really useful to help scientists express their mental vision. For the moment, in my group, we worked mostly for scientists that study a phenomenon in our scale, because it's much easier to be published in computer graphics when you do that. We worked on ecosystem, we worked on geology with the sculpting mountain, and we are now working on prehistory. So it's good because it's a compromise because what we know how to do in computer graphics and their needs. But it would be, I think, also very interesting to work with physicists and biologists in order to be able to have really 3D sketches, enabling them to study uh, their thoughts and to express their thoughts. And I have currently a PhD student starting on that with an insult uh, like um, uh, stories to be told by, by, by biologists. Uh, for the future work, of course, it would be very nice to go beyond specialized models and to find general methodologies. So what I'm thinking of is multi-scale distributions with shapes of any dimension. The shapes can be uh, one-dimensional, has a strand, they can be a surface, they can be a volume. And we have multi-scale distribution. And I think that every object in the nature is a multi-scale uh, distribution of uh, sub-shapes of different dim dimension. Um, uh, so we can express this at every level, we find the same thing. These shapes are moving and deforming. And then we want to allow the biologists, for instance, to add laws and hypotheses on the fly, exactly like in work brush when they were creating by hand their little example, then painting what they learned from their little example. So I think it's an exa exciting challenge and it's very useful work to be able to do that. For me, it has much more, it gives much more sense to computer graphics than working on the metaverse so that uh, teenagers spend their life uh, in this uh, virtual world. The metaverse for prehistorians, for me, is a useful metaverse. Uh, and that also it can also in museums uh, help to have people uh, uh, travel and travel in time, and it is very nice. And uh, why I am calling this creative AI? For, my, for me, creative AI is an AI that makes us human more creative. And if you, we help scientists expressing their thoughts, we make them more creative. It's not an AI that creates for us. We can, of course, like in this old work we did with Danilo Mitra, have something that from existing content will create some new content that maybe nobody wants. What we would like, rather, is to be able to build on AI to make humans more creative, so give control to the user, sculpting, sketching, and so on, injecting hypotheses, pipettes, uh, tools, and so on. And we have smart models to help. And here, the smart model will help interpreting user gestures, duplicating details, and maintaining constraints, which is things that us humans, we don't care of. We prefer that the system does it exactly. So, and what we want to, to do is really to be able to combine prior knowledge with light learning, which can be done on the fly. And there may be one exception when I think that deep learning could be useful, is maybe for interpreting user gestures. So this is, a, for instance, if you want to do a group selection in this, 
Uh, in, in this paper, we use the deep neural network to be able to, to learn which shapes should be grouped. For instance, here, all the, when you pick one of the red dots, all the other red dots are also picked if you want to do group selection. Here, we don't have a specific rule because it combines a lot of perceptual rules. So in this kind of case, you can pre-learn a neural network, and why not using it? But when you have other ways to do it with much lighter learning, I think it's much better for the world not to use too much energy. So I would really like, I tell my students to restrain their use of deep learning the more than they can, that they can and go to light learning whenever they can. That's all. This concludes my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. We have time for questions. Are there any questions from the audience? Please feel free to ask. Yeah, please. Where, for example, you create the tree from just examples, or you shape the mountain with your fingers, uh, do you have, in the end, some metrics uh, that also validated what comes out of your um, process, mirrors what is actually reality? Uh, I'm thinking of this because, uh, for example, applying forces on different sides of, of a mountain to create a mountain is probably not very natural, right? In, in, in reality, you have tectonic plates, but you cannot push the, from different sides. So I wonder if what comes out of that is then also corresponding to what you would see in reality. So, for instance, here, uh, of course, we use, sometimes we, in computer graphics, we can use pre-validated models from the other scientists. For instance, here, for the, for the erosion that you see, fluvial erosion, it was a model from them that we just accelerated, and we, we can check from their curves and so on that we still model the same phenomena, okay? Uh, in other case, so, uh, so this is when we have the model which is already validated in morphogeology, then we just reapply it and make it more efficient. So in this case, it works. Uh, in other cases, what we another kind of validation we have, for instance, in the case uh, in the case of Montaigne, is also if you look at the paper, we also uh, uh, show that we have specific um, um, formation, like uh, formation of Montaigne, that uh, specific patterns in the Montaigne that we can exactly uh, reproduce, and so we show it side by side or by making measurement in some cases. And uh, something which is interesting here, for instance, is that we didn't, for here, for cross has layered sheep. So, in fact, it makes some uh, folds with a given wavelength. And it was shown in several papers, both in physics, in geophysics, and in graphics, that there is a link between the thickness and the wavelength. And it was a result of a simulation. So when we have this uh, procedural law that gives us, okay, for our thickness, we have a given wavelength, you don't need to do again and again and again a physically based simulation. Well, you can just use the result and you know that you will be correct because it has been demonstrated in other papers. And it's only on combining this prior knowledge and this uh, efficient simulation that we can do something. But here, as you have understood, when I think that it's like a drafting, drafting system for scientists of other disciplines. So in this case, they don't want necessarily to, to simulate uh, how, I don't know, New Zealand will be in, uh, in this specific part of New Zealand, what will be the height in 10,000 years. This is not their goal. What they want is to express their general idea of a model and to be able to test it and change the hypothesis and say, okay, if I change this, how will it change and so on. So it will be something necessarily more coarse, but sometimes it's what you, you want, in fact, even in other sciences. So they were really happy with this collaboration. It was really useful for them. Over there, yeah. Um, hello. Uh, towards the end, you were you were you were talking about how you want to move to some more generalizable ways to describe everything because everything is a multi-level distribution. But how do you see this sort of? How would the user be able to express the materiality of this? Because it's not just about the interaction. I, I want to shape, but all these different types of materials. If you move to general, is this just a lot of parameters? Is this a grammar? How you express? Exactly, this is a very good question. This is really the most difficult, but I think that the most inspiring is the way artists draw here. 
The idea is that you have something very coarse. Imagine I am a biologist. I want to draw, to draw cells in a, in a blood vessel, for instance. Uh, what I will do is that I will do my rough shape, draw the little circles that can be interpreted like spheres with my sketching system. And then maybe I will put some motion. Maybe I will put a flow motion, and my gesture will give the speed. And I will say, OK, yes, but my, I want that, that my membrane, uh, uh, maybe there is collision with the membrane. So I will add a little arrow saying, OK, if I'm close to the membrane, there will be a bouncing motion. Maybe I will do a gesture for some jittering. So my idea is that if, like if the scientist was sculpting uh, an animated sketch, a 3D animated sketch, by sculpting in the sense that they, they add and add by little gesture or little touch, they will add some laws. They will say, OK, yes, yes, but this, this uh, cell that goes across the membrane, I want it to retain its volume. So there is a constant volume, because you have also the preservation of mass, volume, surface that can be applied at any at any dimension. So this is my idea that there are some uh, kind of generic laws that can be then selected and reused by the user on the fly while they are refining their thoughts and seeing it always in front of them some interactive experiment with some motion. So they can refine the shape even when the shape is already animated. They stop the motion and then they refine, they zoom into it. And what I would dream of is to have kind of infinite zoom, that they can zoom and add motion and shape at another dimension. Because some, some, sometimes something that you see like a surface, when you zoom on it, it's not really a surface. It's just like the canopy of some little things that are of other dimension. That are, and, and when you zoom, it really the, ne the, the matter changes structure. And this is what uh, interests me. And, and do you see language as a form of input for this sort of stuff? Like, I want this material to be like this, I don't know, plastic or something. Or no, it's everything uh, you is more... You could imagine to have a pipette tool that would take this kind of material from a video and say, OK, I want my material to react like this, ideally. This mm -hmm. could be what the user wants. Maybe the user will tell me, OK, I have this constant and I have these physical parameters because I know it was already studied, so I can input directly the parameters. Uh, ideally, you would like to do it by analogies. This is why I say it's interesting to learn on the real data, but maybe I don't want to learn everything from the real data. A little bit like the herds of animals. I wanted to learn only the rough distribution, not the position of each animal. Uh, so you could learn just one of the characteristics of the data from your pipette tool and injecting it into a simulation. Thank you. Thank you for the great talk. Um, so you talked mostly about providing these simulations um, to scientists to help uh, express their, um, their ideas or learn more about the hypothesis. Um, what is your opinion on uh, generalizing this, this approach of, of providing um, creative virtual environments to like, other levels of education, say to like, high school students, uh, university students, getting like, into this whole area of, of technical and creative uh, education? Thanks. This is a really, really good, uh, good idea that we also were thinking of. Of course, application to education are very important because if you want students to appropriate the knowledge, you should not give them the knowledge. If they can experiment with, with something which is interactive and, and they get some uh, feeling of this knowledge of how it works, it will be much better for them. And they could even ideally express several hypotheses they have on the laws and do themselves the, the experiments. And in fact, we are talking with people in museums to have this kind of, uh, of uh, at least for the prehistory, there is an appli obvious application to museum where, where you could really uh, also put this in the hands of the user. So I have a question. <laughs> so, um, okay, Henry, sorry. You no, first. No. <laughs> yeah, thank you for a very inspiring talk. I, I wonder if you could say more about what you said was is the next step in working with um, the paleontologist on understanding how uh, Homo erectus uh, people uh, would uh, behave to, for example, chase large mammals. That seems to me like a tremendously difficult task, and one that we don't know how we would even verify. Right? One could imagine that based on uh, what you have said, that there's a lot of uh, changes in the morphology between um, 
humans, modern um, Homo sapiens and Homo erectus, and that will change the way that they uh, um, move around in the terrain. So this is the first thing to do, and from the, the bones they have, for instance, they know that, um, sorry, I don't have all the words, there is a little canal within the bone, and in their case, it was much thinner because the, the bone need to be much more rigid. So the bone itself is heavier. Of course, we have only bones. We don't have their muscular mass. So we only can, have, we can only have hypothesis on their muscular mass. Uh, and and, and we, they had a, um, the shape of the hips were slightly different, which means that also the way they were working was slightly different. So this means that they were work at many different scales. Uh, of course, so, so we need to work on, this is why I said that one of the challenge is to uh, extract uh, from these few bones possible model of their morphology, but they are much closer to humans that uh, would be monkey, for instance, any kind of monkey. So uh, we, we, can, uh, we, we worked, um, I don't have the images here, but a long time ago, we had a paper at SIGGRAPH called Anatomy Transfer, where from the envelope of a body, we could uh, transfer by copy-pasting all the internal, uh, like uh, uh, skeleton, uh, muscles, and uh, all the organs into a new envelope. Anatomy transfer is, is used by a company created by my ex-colleague Francois Faure called Anatoscope to, to have a surgery based on a, the shape of a real patient, for instance. We can try to use the same kind of technique, but here we don't have the external envelope. We have to start from the bones to think, okay, this was the weight, so this is a hypothesis on the muscle that was needed to be efficient. Then to, ha to have efficient working, we have this inverse pendulum model that tells you that to be, to be the more relaxed you, and you use less energy, if you just take this mass here and you leave it fall a little bit, so this gives, it, gives you the way you walk. Uh, and then we have to adapt it to slope. And, and when you are carrying something like uh, the carcass of an animal on the shoulders. So, of course, there are all these. And this is why I said that uh, we, we cannot, it will be, it's very challenging. But we want to do it, we will try to do it with two levels. The course level, where we have this energy-based formulation for locomotion. And from the fine level, we will give better parameters to this energy, in fact. On the course level, we will model has a, each virtual human has a particle, and we, are, we have a PhD student experimenting with reinforcement learning for crowd animation. For the moment, what I can say is that it's not at all successful. Reinforcement learning makes really these, these uh, particles behave like robots, very symmetric and so on, and not at all like humans. So human-like reinforcement learning is very, very challenging. Maybe it's not the right way. This is why I was saying we are, we are currently studying two different ways to do it. And then there is all that, but even if we don't finally solve it, at least there is interesting work on the way. This is my viewpoint. And it's better than nothing. And, and then this prehistorian, they would like themselves to go into virtual reality and to hunt with the prehistoric human to observe them. And, to, and maybe they will, in, with that, invent themselves how they could have done it. Because they found like a, like a 72 uh, uh, bones of uh, 72 uh, huge reindeers in the cave in the same ground. So this, this meant that the men that were there were very few of them. They were very, very successful. So we know that it happened. We now we have to find out how. Uh, thank you. That's a, a very lovely answer. Did I, can I summarize that by saying that you said we will not be able to verify that they did it in this way, but there'll be a lot of interesting things we'll learn on the way. Exactly. I think that's a lovely answer. <laughs> Questions? No? So I have two. <laughs> Thanks for your talk. Uh, I'm really impressed by all the tools that you created over the years. And I also, uh, the first question is an application question, which is quite pressing. I think it's refers to climate change. I mean, I see many things you do on the cloud uh, simulation, the plant simulation, the terrain simulation. Could you simulate, or did you think about to simulate also climate change impact on landscapes and plants? So this is really an excellent question. Thank you for asking, because this is really something I thought. Uh, so recently, I'm really worried by uh, global warming. I even plan to not go anymore to SIGGRAPH because I don't want to take the plane. Uh, so I came to Vienna, but uh, okay, I <laughs> thought, should I go or not? I mean, I'm really worried by this, and I thought how us in computer graphics could be useful to, 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 uh, to uh, kind of help uh, humanity to, to take this into account and to change their ways. 
And maybe a way would be to reuse what we did with prehistorians without validating our simulations on past climate. If you can do it on past climate, we can change now the hypothesis and try to model future climate. And with this instantiation method as well, we can very well tell people, tell to the people who decide, or even to the public, look, this is your environment now. But if you, if you change what you do, uh, this is how it will look in 50 years, 100 mm -hmm. years, or even later. And this would be, I think, very important to make people aware of oh, that. Yeah, nice in fact, computer graphics can be used to tell stories. If you see the, have seen the last movie Avatar, for instance, it's really a very nice environment that helps uh, humankind be, because be, maybe being aware of what we do to nature. And I think that uh, we could, in a museum or in uh, any exhibition, have people even try their, uh, change their habits virtually and then say, see in uh, 10 years, 50 years, how will be my environment? Mm -hmm. I think this would be very useful. I, I fully agree. Yeah. So a very, very important application. So my, my second question goes a bit in the direction on visual computing. So what is visual computing? Because what I observe over the years, and I think many other people too, so we are incorporating more and more, so originally it was computer graphics and visualization, so more on the technique of visualizing uh, stuff or data and modeling. And what I observe today, okay, there's more and more simulation also at Via Vis, we are really coupling simulation and visualization like you also do, and then bringing AI into it. So in a modern way, how would you see or where would you see the borders of visual computing or are we just getting more and more interdisciplinary and have to team up with more simulation experts, AI experts to... I, I completely agree system. that visual computing looks to be like a splitted area nowadays. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure anymore of what gathers you, gathers us. When If I go to SIGGRAPH and there are half of uh, deep learning methods, I don't like it. For me, it's like a black box, what I enjoy expressing knowledge in my models. And, but if you want to have lots of publications, that your students have lots of publications, nowadays you need to do that. So myself, when I say that uh, uh, I want to be working on other scales of phenomena, if I do that, where can I publish? Will SIGGRAPH be interested? I'm not sure that SIGGRAPH will be interested. Maybe I will go to publish in Viz, but it's not really visualization. It's not a visualization of data. So I don't, don't know either if they will be interested. I think that whatever is the case, we need to do, try to do our best to do something useful. Mm -hmm. And um, this is all I have to answer. Maybe we should redefine visual computing as a very interdisciplinary field. But for of, me, uh, so this is why I started my talk saying, OK, why are visual representations so important for us humans? Mm -hmm. And what can they be used for, used for? In fact, they can be used for to understand the world around us. Uh, as with the scientists, but also through experiments, like for the future global, of global warming. So I think that they still play a role if we see them as a way of expressing ourselves. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Very nice answer. Thank you. And I would say...